I'd like, like to call, call the uh, meeting, meeting to order. order. Uh, today we are conducting a Curriculum Technology Committee meeting. Today is Thursday, January the 26th, 2023, 5.30 p.m. It is being held at the BISD Administration Building, Boardroom, 1900 East Price Road, Brownsville, Texas, 78520. Committee members are uh, myself, being the chair, Mr. Elizondo, and uh, he has informed me that he will not be attending today's meeting. We also have Ms. Denise Garza, which is a member of this committee as well. Other uh, board members that are present uh, is Ms. Gonzalez, we have uh, Mr. Garcia, and we have Ms. Pena that are present. The committee goal is to review and discuss current proposed curriculum issues in order to provide well-balanced and challenging standards based on instructional programs. Please note that only trustees appointed to the committee may participate in debate by the committee. Trustees not on a committee may participate on the committee to the extent the public is allowed to participate. Ms. Pena, will you lead us in the pledges? Dr. Gutierrez, I'd like to hand the meeting over to you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz, uh, board members and committee members. Um, our meeting, as, as it was mentioned, it was on curriculum and technology committee meeting. We will be uh, giving an overview to the board and the committee members of uh, our curriculum programs that we have uh, and what's going on um, right now up until this point in the year. We're in the middle of the year, just beginning the second semester. Uh, we're going to cover what uh, things that we're going to be completing for the remainder of the year. More specifically, uh, the changes in assessment that uh, are uh, going to be impacting our school district in the next few months and those changes that uh, the state is proposing. As you will hear from our presenters from the curriculum team that uh, some of these changes have not been finalized, but yet we're very close to starting to test and to finish the year and so we would just want to give an update to everyone uh, of those challenges that we have along with uh, our pre-k uh, three and pre-k four programs uh, that uh, we have and the criteria that uh, we have for enrolling kids in pre-k three and pre-k four which is early childhood and then we'll cover other uh, areas such as uh, vacancies that we have a couple of recognitions of some of our principals that are here present in the audience. And so um, with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Trevino and her staff so that they can start the agenda and, um, and go on, the, on our curriculum programs that we have for BISD. Dr. Trevino. Thank you, Dr. Gutierrez. Uh, Mr. Ortiz. Chair and members of the board and members of the audience, uh, today we'd like to just start with uh, recognition of some campuses. As we know, uh, the state identifies campuses based on performance and campuses that perhaps consistently have not done well are placed on a list of targeted or additional targeted. But we're very, very pleased that we used to have uh, nine schools on the list and four of them were removed this past year. So we, I mean, super, super job. And we know that the efforts to move out of this targeted list or additional targeted list is not easy. It takes a group of people. As that saying says, it takes a village. It's the individuals that serve the kids nutritious meals every day, our FNS department, our individuals that transport our kids safely to school, our transportation department. It takes efforts from the individuals cleaning classrooms, our custodial staff, our teachers every day planning to ensure that they're getting effective lessons, our administrators monitoring and ensuring that all resources are available. Certainly our administrators here at Central Office 
as well as our school board, our parents that ensure that they come to school every day, that sometimes we ask them to bring them in on a Saturday. We ask them to stay for extended day, and they're very supportive. Certainly our students that are at the front line needing to do their very best, but it does take a team effort. And really we want to thank the board because moving campuses out of targeted or additional targeted is because you support the programs and you ensure that we have all the resources. And thank you uh, to our superintendent as well for making those recommendations because that is what makes BISD the best choice. So we'd like to start with those recognitions on a super positive. We have three schools that are no longer identified as targeted support schools. And I'm not sure where those certificates are, but I know we had them. Okay, fabulous. Thank you, Dr. Renfro. So we'd like to start with Garcia Middle School, led by Principal Luis Segura. Dr. Gutierrez, if you can come down. Dr. Gutierrez, if you could come down. The staff at Garcia Middle School exited after improving in Domain 3, closing the gaps, academic growth. Garcia Middle School met level performance with emergent bilingual students in both reading and math. Commendations to Garcia Middle School, again, led by Luis Segura. Also being recognized this evening is Ms. Mary Rodriguez, principal of Skinner Elementary. Ms. Rodriguez and her staff exited after improving in Domain 3, closing the gaps with academic achievement. Skinner Elementary met level performance for special education students in reading and math and star overall performance. Commendations to Ms. Rodriguez and her staff at Skinner Elementary. <laughs> also being recognized this evening is Ms. Ada Fernandez. I just want to make sure all pictures were up there. Ms. Fernandez, congratulations. Thank you. Ms. Fernandez is representing Vermilion Elementary. She is the dean there. And Vermilion Elementary is exiting after improving in Domain 3, closing the gap, academic achievement. Vermilion Elementary met level performance for special education students in reading and overall student star performance. Commendations to the staff at Vermilion Elementary. And thank you, Ms. Fernandez, for being here this evening. Also being recognized this evening is principal at Palm Grove Elementary, Ms. Patricia Chacon. The staff at Palm Grove Elementary exited in Domain 3, closing the gaps. Palm Grove Elementary no longer met the criteria to be identified as a targeted school in 2022 for special education student performance. Commendations to the staff at Palm Grove Elementary and their leader, Ms. Chacon. And as mentioned earlier, this is a team effort, so I invite all the AAs, I invite Dr. Cantu to also be in the picture because these are earned by everyone. Is there any? And certainly Dr. Renfro, please come up.
Thank you, principals. I know that you've been at the school since 7 this morning. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez, could I just make a couple of uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, comments? Sir. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, yes, uh, I'd like to thank and recognize uh, our administrators at those campuses and certainly their staff members. It does take a team effort to move our district forward together. And uh, sometimes we just don't thank them enough and they don't hear it enough. So on my behalf, uh, administrators, principals, uh, and thank you very, very much for everything you do. And thank you to all your staff members and the whole team that works together to ensure that our students are being successful. Great job. Thank you. I just and like I to piggyback on what Mr. Ortiz, sorry, Dr. Trevino. Thank you, because without you, we wouldn't be where we are today. And I'm praying, I'm going to say it every time, let's pray that 15,000 goes through. Keep asking what's the words they can tell you no, and guess what? One day they're going to say yes, just so you'll stop asking. So don't ever stop asking, because you're worth your weight in gold. Thank you for everything. And just, uh, we do want to inform the community that we're going to continue to work very hard to ensure that all campuses are uh, are out of targeted support schools or additional targeted support. Those five schools, Dr. Renfro and the teams from TA continue to support our schools. So thank you again for your support. We were also asked to share the pathways that our students are able to take when they enter school or high school. And uh, back in 2014, TA through House Bill 5 made some changes as far as moving away from pathways and calling them endorsements. So all students in eighth grade are given an opportunity to learn about five different pathways that they can take or endorsements that they can earn before leaving high school. So I wanna just talk a little bit about those five endorsements. They're the STEM, business and industry, arts and humanity, public service, and multidisciplinary studies. Under STEM, for example, we have engineering, aerospace engineering, computer science, and cybersecurity. So if a student takes at least three courses with four hours, because one course would need to be more than one hour long, they could earn that STEM certificate. They could also earn it through taking four credits of mathematics or four credits of science. Of course, some of those at a higher level. For business and industry, through CTE, we have the agriculture, food, and natural resources, architecture and construction, arts, audiovisual, technology, and communication, and business, marketing, and finance. Under this same umbrella of business and industry, we have hospitality and tourism, information technology, manufacturing, transportation, distribution, and logistics. Under arts and humanities, students, if they take four credits of music, dance, theater, visual arts, or a combination of two of each, any of those that they may select, they could also earn an arts and humanities endorsement. Through social studies, they would need to take five social studies credits from Chapter 133 of the Texas Education Code to earn that endorsement. And under bilanguage literacy, there's multiple ways that a student can earn an endorsement, such as four levels of one language other than English, four credits of a combination of two different languages, so they could take Spanish and French, uh, or four levels of American Sign Language, or four credits of fine arts, with one or two categories taken from a coherent sequence, or four English credits. So there's multiple endorsements that we try to promote with all our students. You can see when you look at public service that a lot of them are CTE based, and that's a decision that legislators make, understanding that we wanna make sure kids understand the career pathway they wanna take. That way in early high school, or in high school, they can identify, I like this, or really I don't. For example, here, education, we want all our kids to go into teaching and training as a possibility for their career of choice, but maybe they start and they realize, 
no, I really don't like that, that's not for me, that they identify it in high school as opposed to college. After four years of college, then they do their teaching or student teaching and say this isn't for me. That's why TEA said we need to promote different kinds of endorsements so students can make an informed decision early on. They choose an endorsement in eighth grade, but they have up to their sophomore year to change that. But they can earn multiple endorsements. In the public, in public service, and a lot of members in this room, that's what we do, right? We're in education, or we were in the health science field, or in the human services, law, public service, STEM. Truly, we want to promote for students to know that we want them to serve and give back to the community that helped them. So these are some of those through public, public service. Students can also earn an endorsement through multidisciplinary studies. So they can take four advanced CTE courses or four credits in each of the foundation areas, such as four English, uh, including English four, chemistry and physics. And of course, AP and dual credit courses. If they take four of those, they can earn a, uh, endorsement in multidisciplinary studies. Again, our counselors are super well versed in helping students understand these endorsements and certainly we also meet with parents so they can help their students make a choice early on but like I said they have up to their sophomore year end of their sophomore year to change and certainly they can graduate with multiple endorsements another request that we were asked to bring up are the student requirements for uh, 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 Dr. Yes. Oh, uh, yes just have a couple of questions, uh, Ms. Pena. Yes, thank you. Um, what do we do? Because I've had calls, Dr. Gutierrez, and concerns, like you said, up to your sophomore year, if you change. And let's say something happens and and you, it's, you're going into your junior year and you didn't make any changes and the students are being told, well, at this point in time, there's really not much we can do because of the way the system is set up. And I've had like two parents of the children where they said, well, I guess we have to go to another high school which means another district, if they're not going to let us change. But am I correct? Some students take a little longer than most to decide or maybe one day wake up and say, no, I don't, I don't like this. I, I really, or maybe at home, mom and dad are trying to convince them, and then they see, you know what? I just couldn't convince them. Let him change to what he wants to do. How is it or how are we helping those students when they go into their junior year to make the changes in their junior year and not uh, tell them there's nothing you can do, you have to finish it? whether it's something that you want to do or not. How are we handling those? Those are few and far between, but how are we taking care of those? Well, I, I don't know if any child would be held back or, or not be able to change. Th there is flexibility to change. Uh, of course, we always prefer that these pathways, they start early in the freshman year, but uh, there isn't anything that would stop a student from uh, taking another pathway at any time. Of course. We would prefer that they start early and keep that pathway, but nothing would stop a child from having that flexibility to have other options at any time. Thank you, and that's why I wanted uh, to ask that. That way the parents can know. And if they feel that where they're at, they're not getting the answers or the assistance, they're able to come to speak to main office or go to the top because our bottom line is to get the child what he needs. And some people are just late bloomers and they get at a point in time where, no, I don't want to do this. So they can come and, and get assistance. Am I correct, sir? That's correct. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm Ms. Garza. Dr. Gutierrez, um, I don't know who can answer this question, but does every high schooler need to follow a career pathway? Because I've had some parents say that the child really doesn't know what they want to do. They just want to get through uh, through high school because <clears throat> they don't know what they want to do. Some just want to do welding and are being forced to be in certain career pathways. So do they have to have a career pathway? They do need to identify an endorsement. Now, there's multiple endorsements, as I said. They don't they can have that flexibility of, I'm not liking it, that's why I want to move into something else. But in order to, that's part of the new requirements for high school for them to select an endorsement, but they have the flexibility of changing. We don't want to force a child to take something they don't want. They do need to meet the 26 requirements to graduate, and through that, there is an endorsement that they can 
uh, fit through, including this one, for example, the multidisciplinary. If, even if they got nothing else, more than likely, they're going to be able to earn this one. Thank you. Question on that. Oh. So are we saying, Dr. Gutierrez, that TEA mandates that they have to go through a pathway? They couldn't just go to school, get your basics, like the way Ms. Denise said, because I know some students, some, some are late bloomers, and then they end up being the best at what they're doing. And the problem is when we want to cookie cut everyone, and that's what's happening in society. We cannot cookie cut because everyone has a gift, and some gift developed right away, and some takes till they're in their 20s. So are we saying that TEA mandates that we have to have them on a pathway and does this also apply to the charter schools, that they have to also have them on a pathway? I'm not too familiar with charter schools, but I can say that uh, if the students don't have like a CTE career pathway, most of them would fit in, if not through the multidisciplinary. Uh, there are graduation plans where they meet certain graduation hours, and as long as they meet those graduation hours, the kids are graduating. There is no... Uh, way of preventing a kid not to graduate because there's not a pathway. There's always something we can fit them in uh, and, and be able to graduate uh, as long as they meet their graduation requirements and, and we have those uh, graduation plans along with uh, passing the, the end of the course exams, kids are good to go. Okay, so that means they can have a general. Correct. You know, and not have to be specific. Yeah, multidisciplinary. Yeah, like, they would, like people when they go to college, they get that and then decide later what they're gonna do with it. Correct. Thank exactly. you. Correct. Thank you. Another request was for us to share with you all our requirements for PK-3. So I just want to publicly announce that another school district has recently announced that they won't be serving PK-3 students. So BISD is opening our doors and our hearts and our arms to welcome all those students and their siblings to BISD. So we do offer full day PK-3 programs we just need a student to, when you see the eligibility, three-year-old on or before September 1st. That's all we need for them to be. And then we can get some documentation in order for us to comply with requirements. But so long as they're three on or before September 1st of this year, please come and register at BISD. For PK-4 as well, uh, yes, uh, we, we have a question, Ms. Garza. Dr. Trevino, quick, quick question. So on this list, I don't see uh, income. Is income no longer a requirement for early childhood? Well, we do have on or after April 1st. We must have current proof of income, but that is not whether we're going to accept them or not. But by law, we need to know if we would get ADA for them. No, and the only reason I ask, because I do recall a few years ago, well, many years ago, that was a requirement to be eligible for pre-K. You had to be low income or a bilingual student. And very good question. A few years ago, BISD started welcoming all students. We do get ADA for those that are eligible, and that's why we ask for that proof. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Peña? Yes, and this is important because I've had several parents bring this to my attention. Um, Dr. Gutierrez, where the child is three years old, his communication skills aren't as as good as others. Like some, some people, some children didn't learn to speak in complete sentences till were, they were five years old. That's the, the nurturing at home. Some of us like to have our kids be babies and all they can, and then they grow up when we feel, okay, now you need to become an adult. My question is, are we... If a child comes in and is not uh, potty trained and cannot uh, communicate verbally because mom and dad understand everything he's saying, but the public or the school doesn't, are we putting those children in a uh, behavior intervention class with special ed because of their inability to communicate and their inability to um, not have to wear a, a diaper in school? Are we, because I had a parent call me and tell me that she was told that had to happen because the little boy couldn't communicate. But by the end of the year, if you give him time, these kids will talk like a lighting a match. So are we doing anything different if they have that inability or they have to have this? Because they do, they, they are allowed to come in with a, with a diaper, am I correct? We have body train preferred as, as a yes, preference. Yes, 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 yeah. So that answers that question. Uh, we would prefer, but yeah. obviously we would work with the child and the parents on that. Now on the, on the, 
developmental of, of speech, language, uh, that is developmental. This, it's too early for those kids in early childhood to be labeling them in any shape or form because they're three, four, five-year-olds, and we have to give it time for them to develop before we do any kind of assessment, especially because kids are developing and learning and uh, experiencing different things at different levels at that age. So that is more of a developmental than assessing a child for special ed or any of those needs because we believe that we got to give it time for the child to develop first and see and evaluate that child before we, we assess uh, uh, a learning disability or anything else. So if a parent has a concern and a question because her child was labeled that way, they're free to come up and speak to administration to find out because, you know, it, it, I know it's a real fine line between one and the other, and it depends on who it is. We all have different ways of, uh, of analyzing things, which is only fair because all of us think different. They're, they're free to come in and speak to make sure that they, the child gets the attention they feel they need and not be labeled. Absolutely. Uh, early childhood is we have to s develop the child first before we do anything else. Uh, Ms. Garza. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz. Dr. Trevino, since there is that potty train preferred, my question is, is our staff being trained to change diapers? Uh, this is an extra responsibility that is not in a job description to a regular ed teacher or paraprofessional. So I would like to know, how are we handling this? Because Many times I will say, like, there's paraprofessionals, there's teachers that that is the reason why they do not go into special education because of the diaper changes. So I would hate to put this extra responsibility in our three-year-old teachers and the paraprofessionals. And thank you I, for I, I, I concur with that because that's uh, something that as a, an administrator I had to deal with on campus. So uh, I just wanted to follow up. Pretty much exactly the same words as my colleague here on how is that being handled at this point in time. And so uh, at this point, we are calling parents so they can come in to take care of the issue. But Ms. Ms. Emerson, I believe you wanted to address this. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. So at this time, what, what we're doing is we have a letter, and then we'll give it out again for in English and Spanish. So when the child registers, that if the parent child is not potty trained, we are informing the parent that we will work with them. The teacher will come up with a schedule to for them to go to the bathroom and things like that. But if there is an accident, the child will have to go to the nurse, but we are not um, certified or qualified in order to change a diaper for a child. So at that point, that parent would have to be called in order for them to come if they if either had defecated or if they had wet their pants so that that way they can help them change. They can, uh, we ask that they do not come with pull-ups or diapers because no one is going to be checking to see and we would hate for a child to be sitting in their own urine the whole day. So yeah, the that is the procedure that we're following right now. We need that partnership with a parent in order for that to happen. Uh, may I, sir? Uh, a follow-up, yes, Ms. Emerson. Uh, I know that that process and procedure is in place. But let's say the parent is nowhere to be found and there's an accident, uh, you know, uh, a toilet accident early in the morning uh, and we try all day long and that parent cannot be found anywhere. So the parent shows up at uh, 3.30 in the afternoon to pick up the child. The child has a rash and so forth. Uh, what happens in, in, in that type of scenario? That would be a terrible, unfortunate situation. We do, I know that a lot of the pre-K classrooms ask for parents to bring in a change of clothes in case there is an accident to guide the child in order to help them. Um, if the child has some kind of medical issue and it's given to the nurse at that time, sir, then the nurse can assist in order to change the child, but until they have that medical referral. But we're hoping that that doesn't happen. That would need good communication with the parent and the school in order uh, for the well-being of the child. So we need to have that good communication and good numbers so that someone can come in and help in order to ensure that the child is, is assisted to be changed. Uh, yeah, just to follow up, it does happen, okay? It happens at times, you know, I know that's the last thing that we want to happen, but it does happen. Now, would a possibility be that, let's say the parent is not able to be uh, located, 
that there be a list that the parents give permission of someone else that they can call, okay, the, so to come and assist the child, like backup. Like when we have, uh, when parents come and uh, pick up students, they usually have the parents and who, whoever else are allowed to be able to be to pick up that child. Could that yes, be something? Yes, sir, and that would be that would be appropriate to do. The parent would have to indicate who could be able to come in to assist. Uh, we would prefer that if the child could be changed there, the parent can go into the nurse's office and changed and cleaned up and go back to class. But if it's something that's very much that the child is sick, that it's something severe, that they take them home, but we want them back. We don't want for them to stay home the rest of the day because they would have probably either have to shower them and to change them completely. Uh, Ms. Peña? And uh, Dr. Gutierrez, in case of an emergency, because things happen and you have a child that soils himself and you can't get a hold of anyone, and I'm sure those are few and far between, uh, do we do have the ability for the nurse's station to come in and assist a child in that manner? Or are we going to sit on it and just say, well, your parent didn't show up, just sit there? Because if you're soiled, you can be kind of cause uh, the aroma won't be so pleasant in the classroom. So my concern is, what will you do in those rare cases? Well, uh, obviously, uh, it would be through the nurse. And, and uh, you know, we've already been through this. Uh, Pre-K-3, uh, we've, we've been going through uh, this already. We've had th uh, Pre-K-3 for a while in this district. We, uh, we've been fortunate enough to be offering Pre-K-3, Pre-K-4. Yes. So by now, our staff, our campuses knows. So I'm sure they've experienced these uh, scenarios that y'all are talking to us about. But we've been able to handle them because we've been doing this for several years. How long have we been doing Pre-K-3? Because I know that... Since I got here, Pre-K three has been around, sir, for at least twenty years. It started out very small so, through the program, and then it's grown for the last, I would believe, seven years. Yeah. We've had we've expanded little by little till we've got. But we're talking the about the different part. We're not talking about the sir. Uh, pre, pre, forgive me, Pre-K three itself. We're talking about the potty train because that was something that wasn't discussed. It was like really quiet because yes. some parents we were actually told that the child could not attend until he was potty trained. Until I found out and my colleagues found out, there's quite a few of them that are not potty trained, they're in school, so that parent was hurt. Well, then why was I sent home from that school? So yes, it's been around for a long time, but this potty issue, it has not been around for 10 years. This is something that's come out recently, am I correct? So I wanna make sure we address it properly and equally across the board for every student and every campus does the same thing. That's all I'm asking, because they're all human and they all belong to us. Thank you, Ms. Peña. Uh, Dr. Cantu? Thank you, Ms. Ortiz. I wanted to add, I have the opportunity to work with our school nurses and you talked about, or you asked if with the emergency contact information if we have several numbers, and yes, we do. We have person number one, person number two, person number three. And this is a great opportunity to encourage our parents to ensure that those cards, the contact cards are updated so that uh, we have current numbers because we know that they change numbers and, and, and it happens. We're just encouraging parents to update those cards. The nurses do have the latest and the most current data for supporting our principals and our staff at the campus level. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> Another request was for us to evaluate our teacher vacancies, and so we want to share those. Uh, Dr. Therene, I'm sorry. I thought that you had already done the, uh, the pre-K four, so I was waiting for that. Okay. Just a question. The requirements for pre-registration, that is across the board district-wide? Yes, sir. Okay. We don't have any campuses that deviate from that. From pre-K four? Uh, Pre-K three and pre-K four registration. No, sir. Okay, thank you. Are they being registered online or are they being registered in person? And so that's a good question. Uh, later on in the presentation, we'll talk about our online registration. Thank you. Yes, sir. One more thing, Eli. I'm, I'm sorry, but I really want to emphasize this, Dr. Gutierrez, that all campuses are allowed to take pre-K-3 and even pre-K-4 that have, are not potty trained yet. They will be allowed to attend our schools. Am I correct? We already said uh, potty trained preferred. No, yes. that's not the question. Uh, the question. The answer is yes, it okay. is preferred. Yes, but I want you to answer the question because, sir, um, please forgive me. I don't want certain parts of a school, certain schools say yes, certain schools say no, and that's not fair. I just want to make sure we're doing equal for all our community. We have already said yes, and it will be preferred. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Trevino? Yes, thank you, Mr. Ortiz. So uh, I'll move along to the teacher vacancies and the update on that. 
So currently in BISD, we have 49 certified vacancies for regular teachers and 25 vacancies for special education teachers. 20 at the high school, five special ed teachers needed at the high school, three regular teachers at alternative schools, eight middle school teachers, regular setting, seven special education teachers needed at the middle school. At the elementary, we need 18 regular uh, teachers, general ed, and 13 special education teachers. So like I said, a total of 49 teachers needed right now in general ed and 25 in special ed. As far as classified, district-wide, we have 26 vacancies for our classified staff, three at the high school, one at our alternative center, seven at the middle school, and 18 at the elementary schools. Special education classified staff, we need 16 at the high school, nine at the middle schools, and 11 at the elementary schools, a total of 36. So overall, 74 certified and 62 classified. I just want to also uh, announce, I understand that they may, there may be a private school closing and they may have teachers or paraprofessionals that may be looking for jobs and they have much experience. We welcome them to apply in BISD. Our applications are online and they can apply virtually. Uh, these are just the information specifically by cluster. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Peña. Yes, and uh, the reason I put this on here, I know that uh, are we fully staffed at the uh, Human Resources Department? We're not shorthanded in any way, shape, manner, or form. Am I correct? Mm, any vacancies that we have on, at HR? You mean like the department? The department, the one that where people come in, put their application, and do everything they need to do. And the okay. reason that I ask is, um, I've had people that have come applied, and it took a while to get them on. And they they were told that well, we were missing certain documents, and they call and they say, well, they didn't tell me we were missing. So I'm I'm just wondering, are they overwhelmed where some of these applicants uh, didn't get called to fill in paperwork that they were missing here, and then sometimes they get picked up from other districts who get on the ball and say, hey, you need this paper. So what is it that's going on that's sometimes a little slack, and it's hard. And another thing that I was told that I couldn't believe that they came to fill out the application here because they wanted to make sure that they did it right. And I'm sure this is totally wrong, that they were told they, that the staff at the HR just cannot help them fill out the application on the computer there in the lobby. They, they have to do it on their own. Uh, they can ask for help if they don't understand certain things on what they're filling out. Am I right? So That's correct. Yeah, and I'm telling you because I was told that and I, I, I couldn't believe that. So uh, we, We've discussed this before and, and, and yeah. they're being willing to help and they're there to help them. Yeah, and I always know the people there are very nice and very helpful. So I just want to make sure that when they're missing paperwork, we jump on it to get them so we don't lose them to other districts because we do. That's a lot, 74 and 62, that's a big number. Ms. Garza. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz. Uh, Dr. Trevino, I do see that we do have a lot of vacancies and we do know that, um, you know, with the enrollment, you know, we do have a good amount of enrollment, yet we're still struggling with teachers. How are we as a district getting these teachers to come uh, work for BISD because I do understand that uh, maybe there's people who are not going into the profession but yet we're promoting our district but yet a lot of our kids do not have teachers. So and I know that this has been something that we've been discussing uh, for the past two years and it's not getting any better but I think now we have to really think outside the box to see how we're going to accommodate our students to get the best education possible. And we agree, and we also want zero vacancies, right? This is an issue that the whole state is facing, the nation is facing. And that's why I'm glad that legislation is looking at possibly increasing teacher starting salary, because this is not just isolated to BISD. We've been going to job fairs throughout the state. We are on, I, you know, indeed, we are trying to promote our district in any fashion that we possibly can, working with our PR department as well. Hosting job fairs feels like almost every month, almost trying to see what we can do, working with Region 1 and seeing how else we can recruit. Aside from job fairs, publicizing as much as we can. 
We are even having luncheons for the teachers that are just doing their student teaching to welcome them. And a lot of those came in. Even some we are inviting to lunch, even those that did student teaching in other districts. And we actually were able to hire them. We had a T-test or a new teacher orientation this past weekend. 85 new staff members, including a lot of teachers. So we're working as much as we can. But this is a problem that we are facing. And everyone's competing for the same teachers. Uh, we are trying to promote the education class through CTE to try to hook the students in wanting to, looking at grow our own, looking at the individuals that have hours in education but have not finished. There is a grant that we have that we have individuals that are completing their studies and their education is 100% paid for through a grant with the understanding that they need to stay with us for five years after they finish and specifically in special ed because you can see that there is a need for special ed. We are going to bring to the table, I've worked with Ms. Lipa who I know is in the room. We're looking at the stipends a little more for special ed because there is a need. So that's something that we want to bring to the table during one of our budget meetings. So we are looking at different avenues on how we can attract. But we certainly understand that there is a need and everyone is fighting for the same teachers. Ms. Garza, you had a follow up? Yes, and Dr. Trevino, I, I do understand that we're we're in a shortage of uh, teachers. I just want to see how we can come up with a remedy to uh, help our current teachers who do have a lot of students in their classroom and they have continued paperwork piling on them. And then we have substitute, you know, they're also taking care of a class that may have a substitute in putting grades. I just want us as a district and for administrators out there to see what can we do to help our teachers right now because they're burnt out. We're not finding teachers fast enough. And in order to retain our teachers, we need, we, we need to help them, the ones we currently have also out. So can we come up with a plan maybe so we can sure. prepare? Because we do know that this is going to be an issue even with a new school year approaching qu soon. Yes, ma'am, noted. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Gutierrez, may I? Sure. Okay, uh, Dr. Trevino. Um, uh, who, uh, just a question here, um, who, um, who developed this report? The HR department, sir, under okay. my direction. It, it was well done. Okay, I, I, I like the way that it's by cluster and by every middle school and every elementary school uh, where you're identifying the uh, professionals and certified. That's very, very specific. So I want to commend you for that because it's Thank a you. very, very good report. Now, my follow-up question is uh, these are all existing FTEs. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so any any uh, additional employees that we bring on board, we're not creating additional FTEs. These are current FTEs that have been open from the very beginning. Yes, sir. They've been funded. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, I want to pretty much also say uh, I know that it's an issue that we have not just uh, locally but statewide and nationwide, as you mentioned. But how aggressively are we, and I think you uh, answered uh, part of that question, are we aggressively going out there? And uh, obviously we are because you've said job fairs and you're inviting clinical teachers to come in before and so forth. This report that's here, it's excellent. I don't know if there's a way that we could put it up on the district website. This way... Uh, uh, you know, future employees or people that are interested can see and they can also be aware of where exactly these vacancies are. So that, uh, because the numbers up there, I mean, th that's an overall vacancy uh, chart that you have up there. But I think that if we get specific and put it out there so that our future employees and our interested uh, candidates can take a look at it and say, you know what, yeah, you know, at this particular school, you know, they've got two vacancies. I, you know, I wouldn't mind being there. And they reach out to HR and come and uh, hopefully get them in like that. It's just a suggestion, a recommendation. Absolutely, sir. We can definitely do that. And I agree. Sometimes teachers will wear, and I just want to teach this particular subject matter, so this will give them more details. And so, as you all can see, we do have it by cluster. It is on our website. So, for example, here at Hannah, you'll see that we, have, we need two math teachers, we need an English teacher, we need two special education teachers, a nurse, and an assistant principal. 
and then you'll see the classifieds. And like Ms. Jordi said, it is by cluster, it is by school. So you'll see there Hannah and Oliveira Middle School. Uh, very good. I even saw we had a principal vacancy. Okay, so yes, uh, there. Uh, Ms. Peña, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Okay, I'm looking. I'm blind here. I already went through it. You know how you get stuck and you don't see something and you can't find it, so help me find it? Well, uh, Skinner, what cluster is Skinner to? Because I'm looking for the page. Uh, what page is it on? Is it on, on the Porter cluster? Okay. I see Porter Elementary, Canales, Castañeda, Cromic, Del Castillo, Pudnit, Sharp. Okay, uh, she, what page is Skinner on? She has no vacancies, I'm assuming. Because no vacancies, everything's Correct. clear? Correct. Excellent. Good. And here's my actual question. How, what formula do we use when we're going to staff a school with the amount of teachers versus the students? And I ask this because uh, I've been here a little while, and I remember one time, and this really happened, that they took the number of employees of the school, including your front office personnel, including even the custodial personnel, and divided the total of employees to the number of students to make it 22 to one. And that was a while back, and I, it really happened, and I freaked out because the, the, the teacher is the one who has the kids all day, not your front your office personnel or your custodial staff. And also, I was told that, let's say you have 23, 22, but then you get inclusion four of them from special ed, but those four were not being added to the original 22, when in actuality the teacher has 26, but some of them are part of another class that come in during the day. So how are we working that with actual physical bodies per student and teacher? Are, are you combining well, the, and using the, the special ed that are inclusion as part of the 22, or is that on top of the 22? Well, first of all, uh, I think when you're talking about the entire staff, clerical, custodians, uh, cafeteria, teachers, everybody, that's a formula with the state, which is a financial integrity rating system of Texas. We don't use that because that's, the state uses that for ac financial accountability purposes. So, and, and we're okay there because that's why we have an A in, in our financials. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have an A if we had more staff than kids. So that's that part. The other part is that we determine teacher class teachers or classrooms based on students that we have, and then of course we take into account the the special needs and and the different pro, uh, special populations that we have, and that's how we based our our teachers in our in our district. So those are the that's based on enrollment, the special populations that we have, and and of course in the kinder through fourth we have to meet the 22 to one as much as possible. Well, we have to meet it. Uh, but right now we're having difficulty finding teachers across the board, but more specifically special ed. But we're based on the population that we have and the number of kids that we have, and each campus is unique on what they have. So if a, a, a teacher has 22 regular students and they get four uh, uh, special needs that come in during the day, they do have assistance with those additional, make it a total of 26 students in that classroom? Do they have some kind of assistance? Because I, I'm understanding when these children that are coming into inclusion, they need assistance. So that, that assistant, my question is, does that assistant stay and assist the teacher, or is she pulled out to do all of the duties, and then the teacher stays with all the students by herself? We have that assistance. and well, uh, All depending on what the ARD recommends, right? Because if it is a special education student, we must follow the recommendation from the ARD. We do have inclusion teachers that do go into the classroom, and based on the ARD, if they need to be there for an hour, 30 minutes, they must comply. But the when we do the pupil-teacher ratio, as far as the 22 to one, we may have a few classrooms with more than 22 students, but anything over five, they get a sub in there as well to help alleviate those numbers. Uh, and when you said, how do we determine the ratio? So if at Skinner, you mentioned Skinner, so that's fresh in my mind. So if Skinner had 40 students in first grade this year, when we're looking for next year, we're assuming all those 40 kids will be in second. So we move them by 
they're great. So the fifth, we moved to six. You know, uh, for PK three and four, when looking at numbers, we base it on what we have right now because we don't know what's coming in, right? But we do move the student with the you know, with the grade level. Thank you. I just want to make sure that we're very conscientious of what we're doing because the word around the communities in 2023 is parents are telling children, don't be a teacher. And some children were born to be a teacher. Everyone was born with a gift. But the fact that we're overworking them and underpaying them, I want to make sure that we're very conscientious that we have to do something because of them. Our society is livable and we can walk around without being attacked or jumped because you're doing your job as educators. So let's just be very conscientious because we cannot survive without them. And that's a definite, if you don't believe me, just go to other countries. You'll be shocked. Oh, no. We certainly agree that we want to have all classrooms filled with qualified, certified teachers. Uh, thank you, Ms. Peña. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Mr. Reno. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez? Yes, uh, we're go we are going to go ahead and, and continue, and we're going to move now to the school ratings. Yes. Go, so, go uh, ahead, Dr. Trevi. Yes, sir. So every year, TEA rates our schools and our district, and uh, TEA is conducting uh, an audit, per se, of BISD, and a letter has been gone or has gone out to the community explaining why the district right now is currently not rated under review. I appreciate Dr. Gutierrez uh, communicating with TA, and I know that probably w uh, the letter went out because of superintendents like Dr. Gutierrez calling to see how a district was blindsided and not letting or informing the 56 districts throughout the state that this would be affecting their taper report. It did not, however, affect our school ratings for each individual schools, so we want to share those. Although they did communicate with Dr. Gutierrez today, that it looks really good. Our data submitted does not look like it's raising any red flags. So hopefully all ratings will be back on February the 15th, if I'm correct with that date, Dr. Gutierrez. That's, that's correct. Yes, we're looking forward to those. But very happy, as I said earlier, the ratings are because of the work of everyone behind me, in front of me, and completely even outside of these walls because the students worked hard, teachers worked hard, administrators worked hard, and everyone along the way supporting them. So you see before you the ratings for our elementary school. Not a single elementary school is rated anything but an A or a B. And that is because of hard work and support from everyone. Aiken rated a B, but look at that, that's a high B. It's at an 88, bright A, El Jardin A, Garza, A, Morningside, B, with an 86. Palm Grove, 90, Southmost, 99, ladies and gentlemen, a solid A. Very proud of our Lopez Cluster. Porter Cluster, Canales, B, with an 85, solid B. Castaneda, A, 96. Cromac, B, 80. Then Castillo, B, 89. They really wanted that A. A few kids. Putnet, A, 91, Sharp, A, 97, Skinner, A, 91, commendations to the Porter Cluster of elementary schools. Look at Pace, ladies and gentlemen, all A's. <laughs> Benavides, 98, Garden Park, 92, Keller, 99, Martin, 91, Ortiz, 97, Russell, 90, commendations to the Pace Cluster. Rivera, all but one, and that one was an 89. That hurts. Breeden, 97. Champion, 95. Gallegos, 91. Gonzalez, 99. Peña, 97. Vermilion, 89. Commendations to the Rivera Cluster. Hannah Cluster, Burns, A, 96. Egli, A, 95. Hudson, A, 97. Paredes, A, 96. Perez, B, 89. Commendations, yes, to Hannah Cluster. And it's good to say all those A's. Pullum, the Veterans Cluster, A, 98. Villanueva, B, 87. Ituria, A, 95. Commendations to the Veterans Cluster. Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't easy. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes the effort of everyone. 
So anyone and everyone in the room should stand up for that commendation. And I mean everyone. Our middle schools, and we know that in middle schools, well, we start with a little more of the developmental, and we start, and we're not making excuses. Elementary has challenges. Dr. Gutierrez said that and started his, you know, meeting by saying there's a lot of challenges. In BISD, we take those challenges and make them opportunities. So there's opportunities in our middle schools to continue to grow, but it's not easy to even be a B in middle schools. We are solid Bs all over with our middle schools. Bistedo, 85, Lucio, 87, although they have every single distinction they could earn at Lucio. Garcia, 85, Perkins, 87, Vela, 86, Oliveira, 87, Falk, 85, Manzano, 88, Stell, 82, Stillman, 88. And we're continuing to move forward together. Yes, Ms. Longoria, correct? Yes. Solid, thank you so much. And our high school ratings, solid Bs, and we have. D <coughs> comment. Yes. Mr. Garcia. Keeping, thank you. <coughs> and again, uh, you know, middle schools, we need to keep in mind that these are COVID students. So as a result, that's why we have the 88s. Otherwise, I think it would be sh reflecting different numbers. So nothing to be ashamed of. Nothing We're absolutely. moving forward, like you said. Thank you. And you know, very proud, none of our schools in BISD was below a B. That is not an easy task. Commendations to everyone. In our high schools, we have Bex. Hannah and veterans with an A, 98 at Bex, 90 at Hannah, and 92 at veterans, and strong Bs at the rest of our schools. Lopez, 87, Rivera, 88, Porter, 88, Pace, 89. This, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot stress enough and impress upon the community that this is everyone's work. It really is, you know, a heartwarm you know, feeling to know that everyone contributed to these scores. So commendation to the parents out there, our students, our teachers. Thank you so much. Everyone, the FNS for feeding them every day. FNS serves over 70,000 meals to these kids at least because they serve them breakfast, they serve them lunch, and sometimes dinner. Custodians feed or clean our classrooms every day. So I sincerely say this is a team effort. Uh, Ms. Pena? Yes, I want to commend each and every one of you in spite of everything we were going through in this country with the COVID and everything because once you mess with the mind, it affects everything on the human body. So this is outstanding. My hat's off. Everyone, give yourself a round of applause because you have made a shine in spite of everything this country is going through. Thank you, and God bless you. Keep up the good work. You're outstanding. Dr. Gutierrez. Yes, uh, I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself because we do have a budget meeting coming up in about two weeks, and then the week after that we, we're going to continue discussing the budget and personnel. But I'm going to go ahead and interject here what I'm planning to do. We had designed the plan, uh, and we presented it to the board uh, last uh, year at about a plan, a possibility of the school closures at the time. But uh, we're looking at uh, that that's not going to be something that I have in mind uh, because certain things have happened during this year. Uh, for example, here we are almost the end of January, and we still don't know what the accountability system is going to be like. We don't even know what this test is going to be like, the STAR 2.0. We're still recovering from COVID, uh, the, the social-emotional learning of our kids. So um, we'll have a further discussion about this uh, in about two weeks when we talk about uh, our staffing patterns for next year in our campuses. But I just want to make an announcement ahead of time because I was planning to bring it up at that time. But since we're looking at these great scores and they're changing everything on us and we don't even know what those changes are going to be, it's not a good idea to be splitting up campuses, closing campuses and dividing kids and staff when we're going through some very uh, unknown, unforeseen uh, events coming up with the state when it comes to the academic 
uh, of assessments for our kids and our staff, and we're still trying to learn what we're going to be testing in this at the end of the year, and then, and we're still trying to learn what the f rules of engagement are going to be because we don't even know that. So, I'm just putting this out now, and and it will be discussed further. And when I discuss staffing and budgets at, at the budget meeting, but I want to go ahead and say this because we have awesome scores, and. Uh, obviously, everything that the state is putting out there with a the new test and the accountability system is to knock us down. And we're going to fight. And, and we got to keep our kids in their place for now in their schools that, where they belong. That's, that's just a brief on that. That's good to hear, sir. Uh, that's very, very good to hear. Uh, Mr. Garcia? Uh, thank you for that, sir. And uh, yes, we've had those discussions previously. And one of the other things that uh, uh, we should mention is that we had also mentioned that when that should come, we are going to get the com community involved, uh, those uh, students that, uh, and parents that are going to be affected. Uh, they will be part of the discussion. So we need to make sure that uh, keep that in mind. I'm glad that you brought up uh, FNS again. Uh, this is my opportunity again to bring up uh, the importance of having our own distribution center uh, we fed uh, and we were able to keep on top of things because we know that a well-fed student, you know, uh, will be able to perform. So again, I'm going to keep on pushing for <laughs> FNS that we may make uh, that distribution center possible and uh, here in the future. Thank you. Ms. Pena. Yes, yeah, I want to thank you, Dr. Gutierrez, for making that statement to put people at ease right now because I know sometimes some of these schools are small and we want to save, but we never want to save at the expense of losing the child because a neighborhood is a neighborhood is a neighborhood. And I really, really thank you for that because, like I said, those are the because you never know when the people in that neighborhood are going to be the ones that end up saving your life down the road by doing something that will bless you and shock you that you don't expect. But if you look out for everyone and you consider them the way you're doing it, sir, my hat's off to you. That's when people will stand in front of you and take a bullet for you because you're looking out for them and they're going to take care of you. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, okay, well, we can continue, sir. And so with the preliminary uh, accountability, like Dr. Gutierrez said, it's still even up in the air, but I do want to invite uh, Ms. Hernandez to come in and just to break it down for you as uh, simple as we can because it is complicated. And like Dr. Gutierrez said, it seems like they, the changes are made to make it more difficult but we're going to rise up to the challenge as best we can and together make sure that our kids have their academic needs met as well as their basic needs. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Gutierrez, uh, Board President Ortiz and members of the board. Uh, we have here our preliminary 2023 uh, accountability framework. Uh, it's in summary form. So for elementary and middle schools, 70% of the overall grade for elementary and middle schools will be uh, coming from domain one, or 70% of their score can come from domain 2A, which is academic growth, or 70% of their score could come from domain 2B, which is the relative performance. Domain one uh, evaluates student achievement, meaning the star or star alternate uh, performance for students in the approaches, meets, or masters. For our elementary and middle school students, Domain 2A uh, evaluates academic growth, meaning the growth the student made from the previous year to the current year in the areas of math and reading in grades four through eight. Additionally, one of the proposals this year is for our House Bill 4545 students, uh, now uh, labeled accelerated learners, if these students go from a did not meet to an approaches or higher for this year, these students will generate bonus points. Under domain 2B, again, uh, worth 70% of the overall grade, this is the star or star alternate to performance in the approaches meets uh, or masters relative to the economically disadvantaged percentage of that campus. Domain three is worth 30% of that campus's overall grade. There are four components that are evaluated under closing, under domain three, which are closing the gaps. The four components are academic growth, academic achievement, 
EL proficiency, which is their TELPAS performance, and their STAR performance. So again, out of the 100 points, 100%, 70% coming from either one of the first three and 30% from our last column, closing the gaps. For high school, we have a slightly different accountability framework. And again, again this is the proposed uh, framework from the state. Out of the 100%, 70% uh, could come from domain one, which is student achievement in their STAR EOC or in their STAR EOC alternate uh, to performance, meaning if the student scored approaches, meets, or masters. Additionally, at the high school level within this domain, uh, the campus would also be evaluated uh, for CCMR and their graduation rate. Domain 2A is the academic growth. They will be evaluating the student growth from uh, eighth grade uh, math performance to their Algebra 1, English 1, and English 2. Additionally, the proposal for this year is to include our House Bill 4545 students, and if these students go from a did not meet performance last year to an approaches or higher performance this year, these students would generate bonus points. Our domain 2B is our relative performance. Again, it uh, includes our star and star alternate 2 performance. It also evaluates campuses in their CCMR and take in, it takes into consideration the percentage of economically disadvantaged students at that campus. 30% of the high school overall grade will come from closing the gaps, domain three, and high schools are also evaluated in four components under closing the gaps, which are academic achievement, CCMR, EL proficiency, which is their TELPAS performance, and graduation rate. So these are the elementary, middle school, and high school preliminary 2023, uh, 2023 accountability. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Okay, these are preliminary, as you indicated. Uh, you know, we really don't know for sure yet. It's just preliminary, but it's kind of like a framework. Um, have these preliminary... Uh, uh, accountability uh, checkpoints have been shared with the campuses? We have shared these with uh, our campus administration, yes, sir. And in turn, I'm sure they're sharing it with their, with their teachers. That is correct. And that's the way they were tracking data, using these preliminary uh, accountability systems. Is that correct? Uh, for tracking data, we have our uh, data wall through Tango systems, and so that's their, their data source. Okay, so since they know what, what it might be like, that data that they, can't, that they have, they can pretty much uh, see where they're at at this point in time as they progress th through the that semester. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Garza? Thank you, Mr. Ortiz. Ms. Hernandez, as our campuses are reviewing the preliminary um, results that we need for our students as they're benchmarking, how are the campuses determining what child needs uh, extra uh, you know tutorials and stuff like that because I have heard some concerns from some of the campuses from parents that the child may have gone a uh, let's just say a 98 on one benchmark and then the next benchmark gets a 90 and they're seeing it as regression so at, so these children are being heard from playing sports after school going to band attending dance uh, practice so everything's having to be delayed till four o'clock or later and some parents are getting a little bit upset over that because to them a 95 to a 90 that that is not regression of course. Uh, if i may answer that mm -hmm. as opposed to Ms. and she takes care of the data piece mm -hmm. and not the instructional piece so I'll, i feel better uh, answering that we do any concerns like that do come up we do want to address those now under House Bill 4545, which is part of our next slide, you'll see there how many kids this impacts. And so we did this past year. You'll see 2,633 students had failed two years in a row, math or reading, right? And so those kids need 30 hours of accelerated instruction. The 2617 students, the 2,617 students, those failed one year. And they also need 
the 30 hours in every content area that they failed, right? And so sometimes uh, t principals, like you said, because of accountability, high stake accountability, get a little stressed when the student is regressing because the state is looking at there needs to be progress or growth. Even though uh, perhaps they go from meets to meets, they're still passing, they'll be in the same area. That's not too bad. But when we hear that kids are being pulled out of electives or they're not starting till four, we want to know what the situation is in order for us to better understand it and provide the support in both areas. The state is clear that we must provide the 30 hours. It could be during the day, but understanding that you're right. It could be a bad day. What's the history of the student, right? Was it the benchmark? Because the benchmark is a cumulative t uh, test like the whole year. That's very different than just what the items taught, right? And so the principals need to look at that. But if we know that specifically, we can address that because we don't want to take away what's bringing them to school either. The electives, the band, the dance, the athletics. So we want to be able to work with them to see how they can get a little bit of both, right? Because we understand it's electives that bring them in and we want to be able to give them those opportunities. Ms. Garza? Yes, thank you, Dr. Trevino. And we do understand that some of our children do have bad days and there's times that, you know, just like our, our teachers, they're burned out. Students get burned out as well. And uh, my thing is, our students are very smart. Sometimes they know, like, I only need this grade so I can pass, or it's just the benchmark. I don't need to worry about it because my oldest was one of those students. So, you know, I know that a lot of the time, sometimes our children are not putting um, effort into some of these tests, but then <coughs> for them to get penalized, you know, having to attend these practices like until four o'clock, and then we do know that sometimes transportation is an issue for some of our parents. I just, we, we do know that extracurricular activities is what brings our students in, what keeps most of our students sane sometimes. So let's look at that because yes, I don't want any more phone calls <laughs> in reference to this. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Pena? Yes, and I'd like to piggyback on that because I get the same kind of calls. And Dr. Gutierrez, I was going to ask that about these benchmarks that are giving. Is that a mandate from TEA that we do these benchmarks? What does the law say about these benchmarks? Because we do have a, some, a lot of parents that say that's not something that my child believes is going to affect him overall, so they don't take it as serious because they feel they're burned out. What does the law require or TEA mandate on all these test after test? Because we used to have a running joke with our kids in baseball. You know, you can pass the test, but you can't cross the street because it didn't say to look right or left on the test, and we would just laugh and joke. But now kids are saying, ma'am, why? Why do I have to take those tests? What do we tell them? Benchmarks are not a mandate, but it is a, a part of a monitoring student progress that we're all responsible for, and, and we have a responsibility as educators and as, a, as campuses to monitor the academic progress of students. If we don't benchmark kids, how do we know whether they're making that progress or not? How do we know that we're closing the gaps or not? How do we know that they're accomplishing academic achievement? I don't want to find out in May that the kid failed because we never did benchmarks and check and do checkpoints to find out where that kid is academically. So we have that moral responsibility to monitor student progress. The districts that monitor student progress are A-rated districts. I'm just saying, and I hear what you're saying, but it comes a time where something breaks and then it doesn't help anymore. And I don't want us to get to that point. Our students are very smart, like Ms. Denise was saying, they're very smart. And they'll say, you know, I don't need that. So my point is, where can we meet in the middle to take care of the teachers that are being stressed and overwhelmed beyond belief and these students? Because, you know, the different minds think different ways. How do we do it so we can balance it and not just, I don't know, uh, mentally these kids are being stretched and, and, and pulled and they're at the point where it doesn't matter to them but it does to us. How can we find a balance so that we don't overdo it? I know what you're saying, it's very important, very important, but you know we're human and sometimes we can go overboard. I just wanna make sure we have a balance for our students and our teachers. I, when I was in Austin, 
Go ahead, sir. Le, le, that way you can answer it all at yeah, once. I didn't want testing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I see what uh, Ms. Pena is saying, you know, because we hear that time and time again. We need to figure out really which, at what time do we really need to do those benchmarks because we're not letting teachers teach and we're just preparing for that benchmark. We need to allow them more time to teach and instruct. Here we're giving benchmarks on something that they haven't been taught yet. But I mean, and the thing is, is they're being stressed out, both teachers and students, over something that has not been taught. So we need to take a look at that. You know, how many true benchmarks do we really need? So let's take a close look at it, uh, if at all possible. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, we were in Austin about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez, uh, Ms. Denise Garza, myself, and uh, uh, Ms. Daniela Lopez, and I, I want them to get rid of testing. <laughs> I want kids to, sure. teachers to teach what they need to teach and kids to learn what they need to learn. I'm not, a, I believe that uh, uh, there should be more advocacy, but there's a lot of push out there that uh, we need to eliminate assessments altogether because, uh, and go up and go back to, you know, our ABCs and, and our, and teach, you know, but uh, unfortunately, we have a, 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 an accountability system. We have a graded, uh, grading system A through F, and that's what we have in place, and uh, we, have, we're, we are following everything that we can to assess and, and check on progress. I'm, I mean, I'm not, an, I'm not an advocate for assessments. I want you all to know that, but I don't have a choice. I have to... Uh, continue with what we have in place, and maybe this legislative session they'll list up on some of the testing. Maybe they'll they'll eliminate some of the tests that we may not need anymore. But it doesn't look like it because we're they're they're uh, revising a, a a brand new test all over again. Mm -hmm. Just when we caught up with them, now they're changing everything again. So here we go, Ms. Pena. You may, and please forgive me. I'm gonna step on a lot of toes. We have a lot of testing because there's money involved. I'm sorry. I'm gonna be very black and white. We have testing because people get paid to make the test and give it to the schools to give it to the students. So we need to make sure, and I'm, I'm talking to today's youth, you're growing up, change this country and get yourselves elected to office to stop this, for goodness sake. Because we have testing because there's money involved. If they would do the test for free and not get paid, I guarantee we'd be just normal. My concern, I'm, I'm telling you. So here's my thing. What does TEA mandate as far as benchmarks? How many we have to do per semester? Is there... So that's what I'm saying. Can we please look at this and see? We have very bright students, very bright teachers, very great administrators. Let's look at how we can do it so we can ease off of these teachers and ease off of these students because these teachers and these students are saying, you know what? I siempre no. I'm out of here. We can't do that right now. Please help us help them so they can better themselves and they can, make, they can enjoy coming to school and coming to work. That's what we want. Okay. And uh, I, yeah, there is no mandate. So Dr. Gutierrez, maybe we can take a look at this in the future. Okay. Uh, the benchmark that we took in December was the first benchmark uh, of the year. The others had been six weeks assessments. And just for to make sure that you know we're transparent, when we do get the results, we get them how they did and with the whole test and also how the student performed just with the standards that had been taught. And so just want to share a little bit about TELPAS. TELPAS is the assessment that is at the same level as STAR, but sometimes we don't realize how uh, equal it is when it comes to accountability. The bus is administered to all our EB students, our emergent bilingual students uh, throughout the state. They are um, evaluated in four domains, the listening, speaking, reading, and writing of the English language. In each of those domains, they're given a rating of beginner, intermediate, advanced, or advanced high. Then they gave it, get an overall composite score. This is changing. The ball game is changing for this year because we're adding writing, and this time it's going to be typed out, just like the star. So because of that, they're eliminating the writing from accountability. They're not eliminating the writing from the test itself. But the way the districts are going to be evaluated is on listening, speaking, and reading. And students that are emergent bilingual 
will be monitored based on growth from one proficiency level to another in, these, in at least two of the three. So in listening, speaking, reading, in at least two of those, they need to move from beginning to intermediate, or if they were at intermediate, move to advanced, or if they were advanced to advanced high. This is just being announced. In addition to that change, I don't know if you all remember, we had 18 campuses last year, district-wide, that did not meet the cut point. We needed 36% of our EB students to move one proficiency level up in the composite rating. So they went from beginning to intermediate or intermediate to advanced high. They moved up at least one. So out of 100 EB students, we needed 36 of them to move up. They're making cut point changes. In elementary, because they're taking the writing out of accountability, the kids still need to write. They're just not counting it for accountability. That 36, they're moving it to 49. So 49% of our elementary EB students need to move up two proficient, or at least one proficiency level in at least two out of those three. That is a huge jump from 36 to 49. We did have all our principals give feedback to TA last Friday saying this may not be fair or is not fair. At the middle school, that 36 has grown to 44%. So middle school students, 44% of our EB students need to grow at least one proficiency level in two out of those three. In high school, they did move this one down a little bit from 36% to 34%. But again, we are monitoring those 18 schools and providing as much support not only to those 18, but all our students throughout the district. But we wanted to share that because this is a huge jump. We shared it with our principals because it just came out. Even though it's being proposed, they're very specific with the cut points. So, and this assessment, by the way, is starting like in 16 days. The window is opening. Ms. Pena? Okay, so it's being proposed. And then in 16 days, it's going to get done, is what I'm hearing you say? Are in there? 16 days, the students start testing. For this. And, for and, this. And it's very difficult because I see middle school. I don't know. Middle school is one of the hardest. Um, to me, angels are teachers in middle school because the kids don't know they're coming or going. They're developing. Their mind is growing. Their ideas, they're just, you know, everything in their body is just changing. And then for them to have to be tortured, and I'm, forgive me for using that word, with these changes for their minds and the teachers just compounds the difficulty for these teachers to make sure that this student makes it to go on to high school. Because the most difficult time of a child's life in school is middle school. And you have to have a special person to teach that class to understand what they're dealing with, who they're working with, because they're going through a lot. Who came up with this is my question. Who did they do a committee? They got together? Did somebody just wake up one day and say, ah, let me move this up? How, do we, how did they come up with this? Do you have the details? Uh, no, ma'am. TA got together with their assessment department, and I'm sure, I'm assuming, this is just an assumption, that they have teams of people working collectively. I mean, our principals did appreciate the writing piece being halted for a year, but we did provide as much feedback as we could. We even modeled pretty much collectively what we could say. I'm sure they got bombarded with emails from BISD because we were all administrators, were all responding and giving feedback. It, I mean, but we don't want to also be caught off guard and at the end say, well, we didn't know. We're providing them with information as quickly as we are getting it. We're rolling it out so we can at least prepare as much as we can our students because we don't want for them to feel disappointed, discouraged, that there is no progress. You know, like I said, we had 18 schools last year that didn't even meet the 36. But we're working as much as we can, you know, uh, with them 
to provide them the resources, the support that they need. But we wanted to be transparent with you during this committee meeting so you can know what we're going through, what the principals are going through, what the teachers are going through, and at the end of the day, what the students will be put through. And my, if I understand, you said that the writing, uh, they're not gonna do that? They're gonna do the writing, it will just not be for accountability. Okay, and but is there a reason why they're doing it? Is it gonna be on the computer, the writing? Yes, that's why. No, is it possible because when your fingers touch a letter, it touch the wrong one, and all of a sudden you get misspelled and that counts against the writing, am I correct? Does it? Is that the possibility? Because uh, when you're talking computers. Because this is the first time. And computers autocorrect sometimes. You know, they have their own little brain that somebody put in there. So is it possibility maybe they'll keep that off? Because it's very difficult. I'm sure you've written stuff and you've gotten the computer and you send the word and it sent a totally different word and threw off the whole message. So I'm wondering if that's why. And if that's the case, they need to leave it off completely until somebody redoes the computers. Mm -hmm. And the, I, this is the first time that it'll be tested online. And that is why they decided to halt it for one year. I'm not anticipating that they're going to delete it because to learn a language, you need listening, speaking, reading, writing. Well, thank you. And we need to stay on it because the computer does autocorrect. And that will be a nightmare for the children. So I understand yes, what they're doing. I just hope they keep it off. Okay, ma'am, continue, please. Yes, sir. So update on CCMR. Again, more changes. So please, I'm just a messenger. <laughs> So right now, this is with our seniors from last year. Seniors from last year count for this year's accountability regarding CCMR. So I'm gonna try to do this in like CCMR 101, okay? So these kids graduated last year. They're gone, got their tassel, got their cords for being CCMR ready. We were at 99%. We knew how the game ended. Well now, there are some courses that they call sunsetting. When you, you know, like a, the sunset, they're going down. They are sunsetting for IBC certifications for CCMR. So the kids can still get it, but we're not going to get credit for them earning that industry certification. They're sunsetting Microsoft uh, Word Specialist Excel, Microsoft Office specialist uh, Office Word and Office Excel. OSHA and the Google Analytics, they're sunsetting them. They're going to sleep, but they're going to sleep in 2024. But now they're saying they're going to sleep in 2024, but those that earned it even last year, so district, if you had 100 kids that earned it in any of those four, we're only gonna give you credit for 20. The game is over and they're changing the rules. We have given feedback, this 99, if they do that and only give us 20% credit, would drop from an A to a C, to a 78. And these kids are gone. Definitely, my humble opinion, very wrong. We responded to TA. We have sent emails. I even indicated in my email, when you make changes in TA to graduation requirements, you start with the freshman class because you can't change the rules after the game started. So why are you changing the rules with kids that have already graduated? I don't know if that's gonna make much of a difference, but that was my response because I just want you all to see that it would have a huge impact on our students. Uh, Ms. Peña. And I want to thank you, Dr. Trevino. Stay strong on that. It's because it's like saying, you can't change a horse in the middle of a river. You're going to drown. And that's exactly what they're doing when they're waiting to that. So thank you and keep fighting that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Our kids deserve it. They worked hard. So did our teachers. So did the CTE department. Everyone that has a hand in this, Dr. Ibarra, you know, and her team to make the changes definitely not fair. But one of the reasons that BISD is two standard deviations away from the rest of the state when it comes to CCMR is because we monitor what we value. And we value students and we value them getting their IBC certifications. So in the next few pages, you see we start tracking kids 
from their freshman year. This is our current seniors. We're at 88 percent, and we feel quite confident that it will remain pretty, I mean, certainly only get better. We have the rest of the semester to do that. With our current juniors, we're at six, uh, or sophomores, we're at 68 percent. Oh no, that was our juniors. 46 percent with our sophomores, and even 32 percent already with our current freshmen. We monitor them from the second they walk into our buildings. What kind of certifications are they seeking? So we can provide them the instruction that they need to be successful as they search the future jobs that they hope to get after leaving BISD well prepared. So I just wanted to share that because those are huge changes that could have huge implications. Want to share a little bit about our associate degrees and our projections. Certainly students that earn associate degrees also help us get CCMR points. Back in 2018, 2019, we did not have any students graduating with associate degrees. We're happy and proud to announce that that has progressively improved and increased, saving parents in the community thousands of dollars and helping students get ready and prepared for the workforce or to continue their education. In 2019-2020, the expectation started again with our superintendent leading the pack, setting the expectations when he came in. We could only do 33 that first year because we had seniors and they were on track. How can we provide continued support? Finding adjunct professors, finding teachers that had master's degrees that could teach college level courses, jumping to 107 in 2021. 20, and again, in the middle of the pandemic, still being able to offer students the opportunities, commendations to the board for allowing us the time and the resources to be able to provide these to the students in the community. This past year, 307 were projected this year at 350. Again, saving our parents time, uh, finances, money, and saving students time. Uh, Dr. Thromia, out of the 350 students, what percentage is that district-wide? Uh, we probably a little it's over 10% because yeah, we it's graduated. It's about 10, 10%, 10 uh -huh. a little over. Yeah. So okay. one out of every 10 students. Okay, thank you. Mr. Garcia? And I just want to say uh, thank you, Dr. Gutierrez, and thank you to the counselors who are doing a great job in uh, getting these kids uh, you know the associate degrees and thank you TSC mm -hmm. for working as well partnering with uh, BISD and that's exactly what's, what's going to be my next comment commendations and a huge shout out to TSC and the University of Texas here in Brownsville because it is through those partnerships that this is able to happen and become a reality for our students in our community this is a win-win for BISD, this is a win-win for the city of Brownsville. Ms. Pena? And I agree with you because once they get their AA and they can continue, then they can see they continue to get their education here because I was always raised with, it doesn't matter where you get your degree, it matters what you do with it when you get it. <coughs> and I always told my kids this, it's how I convinced them, smart kids stay home because that's where the money is. Otherwise I'll say, I'll mail you the money. You never make it to the post office, do you? So this is an excellent program because it encourages them to finish here and then go on. So thank you for that, and let's keep going with that. Yes, ma'am. So testing, I know it's like a four-letter word, but it is our reality as uh, described by Dr. Gutierrez. This year, testing starts a little early. It started, starts at the end of April and pretty much goes to mid-May. And you'll just see there, I don't want to... Um, you know, cause delays in our presentation, but we do have testing for uh, at least three weeks, from May 24th all the way to May 12th that we will be testing. We are trying to alleviate a lot of professional development, what they learned, you know, they, uh, teachers can execute. I know other co uh, questions that have come up are pre-registration timeline. So as we're closing off the year, we're preparing for 2023-2024. So just know that you will be hearing that counselors, as Mr. Garcia mentioned, 
are already preparing for even next year. Aside from closing off the year, students are starting to make choices for next year. And so those timelines are coming up as far as completing their choice slips. So middle school and high school campuses will post the choice slips worksheets on the campus websites no later than Friday, January the 13th, <clears throat> excuse me, last Friday. So parents have an opportunity to start guiding their own children on what to take the following year. We're gonna start pre-registration. Again, this will be a guide so we can know how many teachers we need for this coming year. So just so you know that, we're already preparing for next year. <clears throat> Another, uh, I guess, task that was given to us was to look at our lesson plans and how we can modify our lesson plans. We did meet with a small committee and then increased it to a larger committee so we can have input from teachers on how we can alleviate some of the workload. We certainly deleted some things on the lesson plan and made some improvements. The committee will meet again at the end of May after testing is over. We can bring the committee back. That's what I told them. So we can say, okay, did this work? Did it not? How can we get it better? There were certain things that we couldn't delete this year because it had already started. So we wanna see if we can even modify it a little more to make the life of the teacher a little better and yet not work harder, but work smarter. So just wanted to share that. Very grateful for the teachers for their input, as well as we had administrators there as well in the committee to give feedback. Mm -hmm. So I wanna thank everyone that participated in that. Dr. Trevino, just a couple of comments. Um, thank you for having this committee uh, participate and the give feedback. Uh, now, uh, this committee was uh, representative of elementary, middle school, and high school? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, I know that you mentioned that uh, you're gonna get the committee to come back in May, okay, as we start looking at the uh, lesson plans for next year. Would it be a possibility to get some feedback from our stakeholders, okay? And uh, you get feedback, uh, then that feedback is presented to the committees, and then the committees can uh, develop uh, a lesson plan based on the feedback that we get from our general stakeholders. Would that be possible? I believe so, sir. I think we can send out a survey first to everybody based on who responds. The committee can evaluate that. I think that would be an excellent idea. Sure, absolutely, sir. Thank you for that feedback. Ms. Pena? Yes, I was going to ask Dr. Gutierrez on our resource teachers, where are we with that? Do we have a lot of vacancies and how are we working with those that are leaving and then those that take those positions? Because I know it's a lot more work and more certifications, are the ones that aren't grandfathered in. How are we working with those right now? As far as what, Ms. Pena? resource teachers? Yes. Does Dr. Terrino know what I'm talking as about? As far as working with them? Yes, uh, like I, as they leave, somebody else is replacing. How many vacancies do we have? And so I know that we, uh, it's in the report, right? right? How many, uh, another thing, like I said earlier, um, we will be looking at the stipends mm -hmm. to see how else we can attract more teachers because we also recognize that resource teachers may need more certifications such as bilingual and content area so it is something that we are evaluating. Yes, because I know we have openings on that sort of country and just to make sure that we do what we need to because they are needed with SPED and all that so we can take care of them because we do have vacancies now. Am I correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, and I think we discussed the vacancies earlier. Uh, so uh, if we can kind of stick with the agenda and move forward. But I meant to ask that, so I apologize. I didn't mean to step on your toes. I just wanted to make sure that I know about that because I don't, I don't remember you giving details, but thank you that you're looking at that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the next item that we have is just a comparison report. Again, we listen to our teachers, we look at feedback. So just wanted to compare June of 2021 through December of 2021. We had offered 1,471 professional development support sessions. We've cut that almost in half. So from June of 2022 to December of 2022, we had 792. So granted, we still wanna offer support but the teachers sometimes feel like it's too much and I don't know where to go. So we're narrowing it down just so we can offer what we need and not necessarily fluff it up. And so 
uh, just to share that with you, that we are evaluating everything so we can uh, listen to our teachers and provide them with what they need, but not overwhelm them as well. So those are all the uh, tasks that I was uh, asked to provide, and I hope that uh, I answered all the questions throughout the presentation. But if additional questions are, uh, if you all have any additional questions, I'll be happy to answer those. You answered them when they needed to be answered. Thank you very much, my colleagues. <clears throat> and now I'm going to hand it over to, oh, I'm sorry, did you have a question, sir? Uh, no, ma'am, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Gantu will be taking care of the technology piece. Thank you again. Thank you for that curriculum update. A good job in presenting all the data and all the information. And now everybody gets a bigger picture of what we're working with. Thank you. And now Dr. Cantu and uh, Mr. Fisher would uh, give us a brief overview of the, some of the curriculum slash technology uh, implementation that we also have. Because when we talk about curriculum, you cannot do without technology is embedded in the curriculum. So go ahead, uh, Dr. Cantu. Thank you, Dr. Gutierrez. And Dr. Trevino, I'm happy to provide some relief to your voice. <laughs> so I have the privilege of overseeing the technology de uh, department. And um, I'm very proud of working with them because there's been a lot of progress. And today's topic is going to focus on online registration. But I know we've got the community and members of this audience that may be wondering, and I'm going to address it immediately, is online registration the, uh, the only option that parents have? The answer is no. We understand that some parents do not have internet connection. Some parents don't have computers at home. So the paper option is always available. And the campuses, they can pick up a, a copy of the, of the packet at the campus level or at the main office. We have them at, at the pupil services office also. So online is available for those parents that wish to you know, save the time of driving to a campus. They have internet capabilities. We know that not all of them do. But those that do, we offer that option. Like I mentioned, both options are available. So what I'd like to do is invite Mr. Robert Fisher, uh, and I would like to take the opportunity to give a huge shout out to our technology team because they constantly are working on how do we upgrade, how do we make sure that we, make, we simplify it for our parents, that we make it easy, that they're not looking for things all over the website. So they've done a tremendous job. We're going to walk you through how a parent can log in and register the child online. It's a very simple process. I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Fisher. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Ortiz, uh, Mr. Elizondo, <laughs> Ms. Garza, uh, Dr. Gutierrez, members of the board, members of the community. Uh, my name is Robert Fisher. I represent the Technology Computer Services Department. Um, like uh, Dr. Cantu just spoke, there are, there are many ways we're trying to do. We don't lose. We don't want to lose any student. We don't want to lose any parent. We, we want to do as much as we possibly can. The challenges that we do have, whether demographically uh, um, or other, uh, is, it does pose a challenge on how uh, electronically that we can register students. So that's always one of those aspects. But we do as much as we can. Over the phone, they'll call us. We give as much information. And like Dr. Cantu, I want to do a shout out to my assistant administrator, Mr. Todd Nichols. He, he's answering the phone most all the day, answering questions. And the majority of them are from the community wanting to know questions about technology. And, and in fact, during the pandemic, many times that we were answering questions of phone calls about how their own home network was supposed to work. So it, many phone calls come in, and a majority of them do. And, and he does most of the solving of the problems over the phone. So without further ado, um, good evening again. Um, the slide that you see before you is the online registration. That's what I've been tasked to do tonight to provide some information for you about that. So um, you've got the. OK. OK. The, uh, at the top of the page on this one, it says go to the BISD main page and click on enroll at BISD. Uh, many departments work with uh, hand in hand to make this all work. Mr. Moody's office from the PIA per, uh, Public Information Office, our curriculum department, we all have a hand in how this uh, gets deployed and trying to make it as easy as possible. Uh, many times board members, previous board members and 
uh, current board members, we would like to get feedback information from you all as well in order to uh, make this easier and better. Um, this is not a fixed um, way of doing it. We have the way to manipulate some of the questions. We have ways to manipulate some of the information. Um, uh, that the questions that, that are provided so it makes it easier for uh, the end user in order to register their students. <clears throat> the next page um, tells a little bit about you click on that information right there you get English and or Spanish. Um, it tells you some important dates as you can see welcome to BISD and it gives you a uh, really really easy clean website in order to click which one that you would prefer to do English and or Spanish. Further down that page, included on the page, are different zoning maps, information from our transportation department, and uh, like Dr. Trevino told you a moment ago, or a little bit ago, uh, the different dates that are there uh, for um, deadlines, read more about four-year-old programs and, and kindergarten first. As you can see, that goes down the page. So it's got different dates on there and a lot of information. Continuing down the page, you have as well as the contact information with a formative and the support of BISD personnel. Um, Carlos Overa, Ms. Gonzalez, both of them from the curriculum department can answer questions related toward those things. That's your contact information and email as well. Further down the page, you'll see the dual enrollment information, some valuable information related to different programs that BISD has to offer. So all those will expand as you see the plus sign on them you click on that and it'll bring you more informative information and as information changes or information becomes uh, more questions are answered they add that uh, really available on a daily basis <clears throat> clicking on either english or spanish will provide um, any of the users for new and or returning users uh, the access to start the process for the registration so by creating your email or putting in your email account and your password that'll open up the portal in order for you to start the registration process. Uh, Ms. Pena, question? Uh, one thing that I wanted to bring up, because it depends on the computer that you use, am I correct, sir? Like mm -hmm. if you have an Apple computer, it, as opposed to uh, a non-Apple computer, when I open it up in an Apple computer, it's not this format and it doesn't have, I can't find enroll at BISD. So I've noticed that on the different computers, it might be different. So I just wanted to make sure that we tell the public where it says search, put in the words enroll at BISD, and it'll open the link in a different format, but it's still the same registration that you need. Because I don't know if you ever open it on an iPhone or an iMac or an Apple. It's a little different format than what if I open it on a non-Apple computer. Have you noticed the difference? Well, you're, 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 you're correct in where it says questions. You can type in the questions, and it'll take you right to that website. Yes, because um, it so won't show like it shows this easily. In the other computers, it'll show like it shows here. In, in some browsers, I've seen a little bit of changes on the browsers, not necessarily the product itself, but some browsers do move things around a little bit better. But for the most part, Google, uh, 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 the Internet Explorer, uh, Edge, things of that nature may still be able to be utilized here. And they, on all of those uh, different programs, all they have to do is uh, put in their a search for enroll at BISD, and it'll, and it'll take, take you, you to there. the site, yes, no matter what format they're using. I want to make sure That's they correct. know that. Yes, thank you. Ms. Garza, comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Ortiz. Dr. Cantu and Mr. Fisher, I know it wasn't part of the presentation, so it's just a comment that maybe what we can have for the next uh, meeting that we have, uh, you know how we're changing to online testing for STAR? If we can have a plan in place in case we do have some technical difficulties, since this is going to be the first year that our entire district will be going online. I know in the past, um, special ed would use online, so we didn't have a lot of students online. So if you can just present us with a p plan in place, so when it comes to testing, we're not, you know, freaking out when we have technical difficulties out there. Excellent recommendation, Ms. Garza. And I just want to let you know that, that we do have something in place. The all hands on deck. Uh, the team, the technology team is divided and ca assigned to campuses. And we have administrators on call the entire day because that is our priority to support our curriculum team. So there is a plan in place, but we will be happy to share it with you on the, at the next meeting. Thank you. You're very welcome.
And well, yeah, I do have a, just a couple of questions here, and it pertains also to the infrastructure, but I think that you answered that question. Uh, I do have a follow-up, uh, and this is basically on uh, pre-registrations as it's being done online. You did indicate that pre-registration for the uh, three-year-olds and four-year-olds um, is available online. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, do we run into any issues where there's certain documentation that needs to be brought in within 30 days? Is that, uh, are we having difficulty uh, having that documentation brought into the campuses when they register online? Oh, sir. They, uh, twofold, sir. One, Dr. Kent is correct. She whispered in my ear, the correct answer. The best thing that I can tell you that a lot of times, the biggest challenge is not only BISD, it's around the nation trying to find that avenue at home in order to scan the documents to be able to upload this to any system, whether it's BISD system, Houston system, Atlanta system, all public education or all educational entities, I, I, for that matter, home health. There's many times that you scan and folks are, are challenged on trying to find out how to scan things either through their phone um, any type of documentation that they have to upload. So that's always a challenge one way or the other is that ability or non-ability to, to learn how to upload different documents whether through your camera and how you send that up to the different departments through the, the United States or different hospitals, different school districts, whatever those are. So that's one big challenge that we all face uh, through the nation. I don't know if that helped to answer. Uh, the yes, uh, just as a follow-up here, also uh, uh, when uh, when individuals register their children I online, is there a way that the data entry clerks at the campus can identify who's uh, registering the child? Because sometimes grandma registers the child without the parents you know, knowing that they were registered. And then when they get contact, is well, I didn't register my child. I mean, is there a way that we can that the data entry clerks can have that information? The, the data entry clerks right now will get notified the moment that that username, which is the email account and the password, uh, once it logs on, it clicks a certain school, that data entry clerk automatically will be able to receive that through the progression. Not necessarily does it have to be complete. Different pages, when you press next, it'll preliminarily save that information. So those data entry clerks would have the ability to at least get the email account and whatever pertinent information was filled in by that person up to that point. But they wouldn't know if it's the parent or the grandma or, mm -hmm. or anyone else, is that correct? That is correct, because it's an email address. However, one of the things that we've shared with our principals at principals meetings, and we, we need to just continue providing friendly reminders, is that when the data clerk prints out to look, give that information to the administrator, or administrators are assigned, so we want them to send an email welcome to BISD welcome to Breeden welcome to what and at that time then they can begin conversations and then they can identify if there's a concern all right very good Ms. Pena yes and uh, some families share their their websites and their information and their passcodes and everything so at, at some point it might be a little difficult but as long as I don't know do you eventually you're going to make contact with them on the phone and, and maybe get to know them and another thing also when we have to scan documents and we have to, e you scan it and you can email it. So uh, would we also be able to take a document that was, uh, you take a photograph of it and email it because if you can't scan it, because scanners are a little difficult, you can t simply take a photograph with a good telephone and then just email it and it's the same thing as scanning. So there's different ways that you can do it and they come out clear, am I correct? That is correct, ma'am. There's different options. And what I wanna stress is that at no point, if they're missing a document, do we say, you're disqualified, you can't register. At no point do we do that. The, and it's a reverse. We, the, uh, the data clerk sees, okay, this student is missing this document. They're still registered. When they come in, we ask for those documents. So uh, we're very conscientious about that. One of the things that I do want to stress that I know that Mr. Uh, Fisher touched on was a section on the transportation uh, website where you can click on that website and let me see if I can slide back a few slides here because I think that's very important especially because we're gonna we are welcoming our pre-k students Dr. Trevino talked about the school that's closing the pre-k program well we may have parents in the audience that are listening and saying okay they're gonna you know we can register them at BISD already the registration is there what school do I register well there's zoning maps and I want to clarify that 
they we are an open enrollment. They can choose the school that they want. And in addition, if they need transportation, they can click on that link on the transportation website and it will tell them the bus route that they're going to have. And I want to give a shout out to our transportation and our PEAMS team because this link was slightly broken. It has been updated and it's accurate reflecting the zones. And so any parent that's out there wants to know what bus route would that be, that information will be available at that link. So we make it very easy for our parents to register. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz. I just wanted to commend once again uh, the staff, Dr. Gutierrez. I was recently informed that somebody enrolled from out of state and obviously they had the, the, the ways of going to any school, private, charter, or public. They did their research and it was all done through our website also and they ultimately chose BISD. So I was very glad to hear that story because again, this is somebody that was coming from out of state, hadn't even stepped foot in, the, in Brownsville actually, to be honest, and they chose the district from out of state. So kudos to you guys because it, it, it was everything. It was our curriculum, it was our athletics, it was our fine arts, and the, uh, the way they got accommodated through the website alone is what helped them choose us. So thank you to you guys for all that you do. Thank you for that. So Okay, uh, we move into the public comment uh, section now. Uh, each uh, speaker will have five minutes uh, uh, on time. Uh, Mr. Salinas, you will take care of, of time. Okay, first speaker that we have is uh, Ms. Angie Villarreal on curriculum. All right. Good evening, board members, Dr. Gutierrez. First of all, I would like to thank an anonymous angel that sent my son a gift for Christmas. Don't know who it was, but thank you. Secondly, I want to thank Dr. Trevino for helping us out with the lesson plans. Thank you so much. Thank you for deleting all that stuff. Uh, I did hear a concern from a couple of people that said that science and social studies still showed 17 items that it hadn't changed. Reading and math had. So, and thank you for clarifying that we have two jobs, grades and lesson plans. So, my question is, who does emotional care, nursing care, imagine math, imagine literacy, but most of all, who does the RTI packets and who does the special ed packets? Because each special ed packet has 20 pages and if a teacher has 10 students to refer, that's 200 pages. And the parent questionnaire takes about an hour. So I don't know who is in charge, but if we're not supposed to be in charge of that, if you can clarify that, because I don't know who is in charge. Now, in addressing vacancies, um, it is with a broken heart that I hold a packet right here for my retirement. I don't want to cry because I don't want to leave. But like Ms. Peña said, we're tired, we're done. I don't know how to explain it to you guys anymore. I really don't. Teachers are stressed, they're overworked, they're underpaid, stipends come up, we're, we're not worth the stipends. We are not worth a retention stipend. $500, teachers thought it was a slap in the face. That's what they thought. And I'm with them. I'm sorry. I believe that was wrong. Teachers, if you hear them, I hear them. They go grocery shopping. Guess what they told me? They had to put things from their cart back onto the shelves because they couldn't afford it. Our paraprofessionals have a list of five items for grocery shopping. Five items, because that's all they can afford. I was thinking about how we have, in Thanksgiving, people donate food for the needy. Guess who the needy are right now? Our BISD employees. 
So I was talking to Ms. Aida Medrano to start a pantry, a food pantry for BISD employees. It is a shame that they cannot purchase food items for their families. And you ask, what can we do? Um, you had two opportunities to provide a meaningful stipend to teachers. There is no retention stipend. That was not a retention stipend, I'm sorry. There is no retirement stipend. Why should I stay till May? You give me a reason why I should stay till May. And don't tell me you have to stay because of your kids. I stayed for 36 years because of my kids. My personal children were put in the back burner to take care of the children of this community. My health was put in the back burner for the children of this community. I worked evenings, I did home visits, and many teachers do the same thing. I am not speaking just for myself, I'm speaking for all of our teachers. Here you are asking, well, how are we gonna get teachers from other places? We're fighting for teachers from everywhere. You know what teachers you don't have to fight for? The ones that are already here. The ones that have put in so much time to make sure that that right there at a report card was there because they put in of their time. And this is the appreciation we're getting. Thank you. Our second speaker, we have Ms. Uh, Ida Abeldano on curriculum. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> I'm Ida Abeldano. I am with uh, AOBE. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to touch on, on several different items uh, that were presented today. Uh, it was a very um, <clears throat> informative presentation, a lot of great news. Uh, a lot of heartbreaking news, uh, seeing what's coming down the pipeline. And, uh, <clears throat> but it was very interesting on some of the things uh, that, uh, that was uh, discussed here today. And I'm, I'm gonna quote several of you all uh, today because there was some very good statements uh, that were said. And I'm gonna start with Dr. Gutierrez where he said, we are going to fight for our students. He cannot be more right on this. And it's going to take every single person that can hear us, that can see us, that cares about BISD, that cares about public education to get involved and make sure that we vote in pro-public ed people because they're trying to shut us down. And they're hitting us left and right. And if we don't step up and take action, they're going to finish us off. I've said it several times before, we cannot stand, stand back and just do nothing and wait for everybody else to do it. So please get involved and find out who you're voting for, who you're electing, who you're supporting, because it does make a difference. Especially if you care and you work at BISD or any public education uh, district, you should care and you should get involved. That's why we are very proud that AOBE and TSTA at the state level and national level make sure that we support only people that have a proven record of supporting public education. So with that, um, <clears throat> I'm also very happy to hear about the campus closures. That's one less thing that they can take off of their plate that they don't have to worry about because it is very stressful. So I am glad that that was uh, announced uh, today. Um, exciting to hear uh, 350 uh, students are projected to graduate with their associate's degrees uh, that is amazing uh, that's things that are not happening at charter schools uh, or private schools so uh, we need to be very proud about that so um, Dr. Trevino thank you again for working uh, with us and the committee on the lesson plans we know it's work in progress but it's a big step in the right direction 
So with that, all of that, now I also want to quote um, Ms. Minerva Peña when she says, never stop asking. <laughs> So that's what uh, I'm going into because how Ms. Garza did mention people are burnt out. Ms. Angie hit it right on the head. We hear it every single day. So one thing that we would like to hear is what is the plan? What are we doing? What are we doing to make sure that the class size does not continue to stay over the limit? That we don't have to file for a class size waiver? What are we doing that, uh, to help bring down the square footage for the custodians? Our poor, poor custodians are so overwhelmed also. They're, they're short-handed, uh, there's a lot of vacancies, and right now, when it's still flu season, we're coming out of a pandemic, this is very important. We need to take care of our own employees. So, um, <clears throat> That's one of the things that we'd like to hear a little bit more as to what are the plans that we're doing to help uh, bring down these vacancies. I understand we're all fighting for these different uh, people, these graduates and things like that, but what else are we doing to try to bring them in? You know, let's entice them, let's do something. We need to continue to work on increasing our salaries. Uh, are we also prepared on hopefully what we receive uh, from the pre-K enrollment from these other uh, districts, uh, charter schools that are no longer going to be serving uh, the pre-K uh, community? And why? Because there was no more money for them in it. It's all they, they care about. That's all they care about. And that's what people need to realize. So, um, but are we prepared for this? because we cannot be overloaded in those classrooms. What is the plan if we're only going with this year's counts? Because we're projected to be receiving more pre-K students. And uh, I, I just want us to be prepared because we want for the, the people to be able to stay here. And regarding benchmarks, Mr. Garcia hit it on there, right on the head as well. We need to figure out as to when it really needs to be required and not just be putting benchmarks out there because the six weeks assessments also carry as much weight. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Esmeralda Barajas uh, Garcia on curriculum. Good evening, esteemed curriculum committee. My name is Esmeralda Garcia Barajas, a leader with Best AFT. I will be speaking on curriculum and some of the issues that I will be addressing tonight, thank you, some of you have uh, talked about them tonight, so thank you. But please keep fighting for our students and our teachers. I was recently reading an op-ed that stated that after Christmas, students are doing STAR practice a third of the time. I was thinking, try three quarters of the time and all year long. Why are we having full benchmarks in the first semester before, before all the objectives have been taught. Do you know how much anxiety that creates for children to be tested on objectives that haven't been presented to them? Do you know how much instructional time is wasted on these practice tests? On the low end, that is 12 to 18 instructional days lost per year. That should alarm everyone in this room because that's not including the STAR assignment practice and tutoring that's done most of the year. Teaching to take standards is one thing, but at what point does excessive testing practice begin to violate our students' rights to access quality instruction? Testing practice frequency is decided at a local level, that means by BISD. Parents of BISD students often don't know their rights and don't question our curriculum. If admin is interested in improving curriculum, let's help teachers by having the curriculum department maybe write star STEM questions for real books and novels instead of killing and drilling the star tests with star formatted workbooks and worksheets. Let's help teachers have grade level meetings where teachers actually discuss ideas for lesson plans and maybe have time to create star STEM questions instead of just more admin presenting data that we've already seen on Tango Trends plenty of times. Believe it or not, teachers do look at Tango Trends way before admin looks at it. Admin needs to stop obsessing over scores and begin concerning themselves with teaching children. I'm appalled at what I see at an A district. I would much rather 
have my son or child go to a B district that presents curriculum in a student-centered way than a district that just drills and ki kills the test using a plethora of star formatted workbooks, worksheets, and star computer programs like IXL Reading, IXL Math, iReady Math, iReady Reading, and the list goes on. BISD, we have a problem when a straight A third grade student just wants to burn his Sharon Wells workbook after every six weeks grading period. And while we are talking accountability, who is holding admin accountable for violating students' rights to our quality education? Why is HB 4545 used to excuse every violation of our students' rights to a quality education? At Perkins, students are taking away elective period for more star prep time, even though they had completed 30 hours required by TEA. And it doesn't stop there. Then for one hour after school, three days a week, there are no extracurricular activities because it is star mandatory tutoring for all students, even if they passed. And it doesn't stop there. As some of you mentioned, if a student goes from a 95 to a 90, guess what? More star tutoring. That is appalling to me, especially because I went to Perkins. That means my mom would have been that mom that didn't have time to go and question what is going on at the school. I read what TA states about HB 4545, just in case I missed something. And nowhere does it say it's okay for LEAs to take away electives to fit in extra tutoring. Again, that is a local decision. Why are we taking away everything that's good in our public schools? It's no wonder our students are so apathetic about learning. Thank you and have a good evening. Our next speaker is Mr. Patrick Hammonds on 4E and G. Good evening, Chairman Ortiz, Dr. Gutierrez, members of the board, Patrick Hammes, speaking on the behalf of BEST, Brownsville Educators Stand Together, and AFT, American Federation of Teachers, a union of professionals. We want to thank the administration for sharing the spring testing schedule, but something needs to be done when we spend as much time, if not more, testing than we do teaching. If you look at the calendar for March, the week before spring break, we have telepest testing, state telepest testing, going on at the same time that we have a district benchmark. Why? Does anyone here truly believe that state testing and district benchmarking should be occurring at the same time? We compound this error by doing the same exact thing the week after spring break. You are talking about two weeks of no instruction. How is that beneficial to our students and to our staff? Look back at the third six weeks testing calendar. We had a district telepass benchmark, a weekly review, a district benchmark where over 50% of the test uh, items was not taught, followed by a week of review and the week of semester exams. Where was the teaching? The district needs to allow teachers to teach. Teachers go into the profession to teach, not to give tests, not to write reports, and not to give more tests. It is bad enough that some of our campuses are mandating that all students attend tutorial after school, then hold UIL and sport practices afterwards, which students cannot attend unless they went to tutorial. This is, coer this is coercion, and it kills our fine arts and sports and increases student apathy and parental antipathy towards the district. Do we want to drive our students and parents away? Lesson plans. A teacher's lesson plan, and I was not uh, familiar tonight, but uh, congratulations on, on reducing some of the objectives. A teacher's lesson plans are supposed to be the outline for the teacher to follow. They're written by the teacher for the teacher. No previous administration, going back to Mr. B, Mr. Bestato, has put such emphasis on teacher lesson plans where they're asking teachers to spend more hours writing a thesis instead of the outline recommended by the state legislator, state legislature under Texas Education Code Chapter 11.164. Teachers could and should be using this time to plan for instruction. The same is true for data reports. Best AFT has won a level three grievance against the administration on data cards and data walls. Administration has now created a five-page report to replace them, where again, all the information that teachers are having to input is already at everyone's fingertips. We are playing <laughs> whack a data report when the information is already available to everyone. We are asking the board to review the testing schedule and apply some common sense to it. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. 
to allow students who are academically successful to attend practices without being coerced into tutorials and to end the excessive, redundant, and repetitive paperwork. Let teachers teach and give them the time to do so. We also want to recruit, if we want to recruit and retain teachers in this very competitive society, not only do we have to pay them, we also need to reduce the paperwork load. Thank you and have the best evening possible. Uh, this concludes our pl public comment section. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez? Just a couple of announcements. Well, one announcement, ra rather. Next Wednesday, February the 1st, just a reminder, at 5.30, we have our policy committee meeting uh, here in the boardroom. And that's basically all the announcements, sir. Anything else from any of our my colleagues? Okay, then I adjourn this meeting. <laughs>